Shauna and Jody here with Real Sisters, Real Talk. We're glad to have you joining us as we talk about growing in our faith with God. Hi, and welcome back to Real Sisters, Real Talk. Shauna and I are here and we are so excited because today is our 50th episode, which is hard to believe. We started this a year ago and we're already 50 in. And we've had so much fun on this journey with all of you. So we wanted to do something a little special for today's episode. And so we have a special guest, but I'm going to let Shauna introduce our special guest today. Yeah, I have to agree with you. It's just wild that we're already 50 episodes in and just so grateful for you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of the community. And we're so thrilled today to have our first ever guest guest on Real Sisters Real Talk, Bailey Talsma. She is our niece, our sister Kelly's daughter. And she. we talked about what would be fun to do, something different, mix it up for the 50th. And we thought it would be a ton of fun to just do like a Q&A uh, question and answer time together. And we thought, well, who asked really good questions? And for sure, Bailey asks really good questions. So we invited her to be a part of the podcast today, and she was willing to to join us. Tell us a little bit about what you do. I know you're on staff at Church with Jodes. Tell us about your role there. Yeah. First of all, I'm excited to, to be here. So thank you so much for having me. And congratulations on 50 episodes. That thank is you. a big deal. Yes. Um, so I work here at Emmanuel Reform Church with my Auntie Jody, and I am on staff as the director of student ministry. So I get to work through six th- or six, work with sixth through 12th graders. Um, and then I also do some stuff with communications and wedding coordinating. Um, and uh, yeah, it is a blessing. It's so much fun getting to work with my Auntie auntie. Um, so that's, that's me. And she does a great job. I absolutely love working with Bailey. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, so can I just jump in and start asking you guys some questions? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, first question that I have is I would love to hear about a moment in your life when you felt alive. Um, so if you could take us to that moment and like, what were you experiencing? What was happening? I would love to know when you felt the most alive. Hmm. I can go. Um, yeah. So the very first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question, Bailey, is labor and delivery and giving birth to my first child, specifically my first child. I haven't felt this way with every single one of them, but just that first time going through labor and delivery, I felt so human. I felt so earthy. I felt like this is what I was created to do. And I know not everybody's labor and delivery experience is a happy story and, 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 you know, one that they would say, yay, I felt alive doing that. But for me, it very much was, it just felt like instead of having to force something, all I had to do was pay attention to what was happening and just kind of like join. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. It just felt very alive. Yeah. I think for me, there, there's so many moments, and I, I don't know that moment when you feel the most alive. Probably the thing I would say is on my wedding day, because all of my favorite people were in the same room um, celebrating, and I got to start my life with my husband, Johnny, and I was so excited. I didn't care if anything went wrong. I just was excited to be married. And so I just remember feeling so alive, so um, excited about what was to come. And the years that we would get to spend together. And we just celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary. So that's kind of fun too. Yeah. Big deal, right? (laughs) That is awesome. Um, Okay. Another question that I have for you. Um, Currently, I am 27 years old. So if you could go back and talk to your 27-year-old self, uh, what would you say to her? So I can start that one. I think I would start by saying, show yourself a lot of grace. Don't beat yourself up so much for mistakes that are made or um, choices that you maybe don't think were the best choices. Just show yourself a lot of grace. The other thing I think I would like my 27-year-old self to know is that this is a process. This life that we're doing, growing in our walk with God is a process. And so allow yourself to be on the journey and enjoy all of it. Embrace life, lean into relationship with him and know that you're going to spend the rest of your life growing 
in your walk with him. So lots of grace. Just mm. have grace. <laughs> My answer to that question would be really similar. I would tell my 27-year-old self, I think I would start by just saying, you matter. You really matter. And don't hold back. Say what you think and say what you feel because it's important and it matters. And I would also say, and relax. Like you can just sit in the pocket of his love. You don't have to try so hard. You don't have to strive you can just rest in, in trusting and knowing that God has got you drawn close to him. And I was at 27, I was drawing in close to him, but I think I felt a lot of angst about having to do things right and having to get it right and not wanting to mess up. And so I would definitely tell myself that, that you are significant and you matter, but I would also say, relax, he's got you. You're going to be just fine. Yeah. You know, in that thought, I think I have one more thing I would add to that grace thing is I spent so much time in my younger years wishing I could undo what I had done. So if I said something and I think, oh, that was dumb. Why did I say that? I would beat myself up and I wish I could undo that. Why did I do that? I made that bad choice. Instead of just saying that's happened and we're going to move forward. And so I would say, don't dwell so much on the past, but move forward. And if you need to ask forgiveness, ask for forgiveness, but we need to move forward. We can't dwell in looking back. That's so great. Yeah. That's so great. I mean, when I was in my twenties, I ended every day beating myself up, just reliving the day and thinking about the things that I did that I wished I hadn't, or the things that I didn't do that I should have. And it was just, it's not a healthy way to go to bed at night. So at 53, I go to bed at night and I'm like, high five in Jesus. And I'm like, thank you for being with me today. Let's get some good sleep and do it again tomorrow. <laughs> <So>. Yep. Amen. <laughs> okay. So follow-up question to that one is if you could talk to your 37 year old self, how would your answer change? Like what is, what would you tell your 37 year old self? That's a great question. I think for my 37-year-old self, my kids were now young elementary to older elementary. I think I would say your God has a relationship with your kids and don't think that you have to insert yourself into that relationship all the time. Allow God to do what he is doing in them. Sometimes they have to learn some lessons the hard way and there are times I think I just got in the way of that. Mm. And so, I, you know, I think I wanted things to be easy for them and I wanted to try to make their life kind of perfect. And God was at work. And so I, in time, I learned to see that and to step back. But I wish I would have known that younger. Mm. That's really good. My My answer would be really similar because I think in my the thing that I learned, you know, later in my forties that I wish I would have known back in my thirties was instead of being the answer to the problem, point your kids to Jesus. And so, you know, it's similar to what you were saying, Joe, it's like, I wanted to be, I don't want them to hurt. I wanted to be the answer. I wanted to solve. I wanted to make, you know, I want their floor, my ceiling to be their floor, all of those things. Right. But I think I would have, um, advised myself to, be less concerned about being the solution and be more concerned about helping them to find their way to Jesus for the solutions. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I'm here to glean from your wisdom. Um, so I have another like advice slash encouragement question. Um, at Emmanuel, as a staff, we go through something called organic outreach. And so it focuses on our call to evangelize and share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus yet. Um, and so my question to you is like, what advice or what wisdom would you give to someone who is struggling to share the gospel, who's struggling to evangelize in their day-to-day -day life? I think I have spent so much of my life thinking that sharing the gospel was an event instead of recognizing that sharing the gospel is a relationship. And I, you know, I, so I put a lot of stress on myself, you know, for the moment when I'm going to share the gospel story of what Jesus did, rather than recognizing the weight of walking in love relationship with someone 
over time and letting them see Jesus in me. And what I'm not saying, let me be really clear. I'm not saying just, you know, be Jesus in the way that you love people and they'll catch it. We need to use our words. We do need to use our words. But I also think that our, our words and our life should line up with one another. So if I'm willing to befriend you, if I'm willing to join you in life and do life with you and come alongside you, you're not only going to see me doing things differently because of my relationship with the Lord, but you're going to hear me say, you know, man, I woke up super anxious this morning and even just in everyday life, you know, we pick up the phone, we're having a conversation because I love you and I'm in a relationship with you. You're not a project, you're a person. And so, you know, let's say we're having a conversation and and how are you today? You know, and I'm like, oh man, I, I woke up feeling anxious and I couldn't quite figure out why I felt anxious, but I, I prayed about it and I'm, you know, these, these verses came to mind and I'm just standing on the truth. And I'm telling you by like lunchtime, I had forgotten how anxious I felt when I woke up this morning. That's, those are testimonies. That's, that's the gospel. That's my life without Jesus, you know, not thinking about him and then Jesus entering in and then how it changes. Um, so I think I would, it, the advice I would give to somebody who struggles with evangelism would be to change your framework from thinking it's an event to recognizing that evangelism is the long game <laughs> mm -hmm. and be willing to love people in the long game. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I would encourage people to look at evangelism as a very natural thing. So Shauna and I talk about having spiritual conversations all the time. And so we can even have spiritual conversations with someone who we're sharing the gospel with. So if somebody asks me, you know, what I did on Sunday, I can say, I went to church. I have this great church I attend at, you know, this place, that kind of thing. Or I can say something like, you know, if, if there's a, something I'm struggling with, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this situation or this relationship. But what I'm doing is I'm asking God for help in that. And this is what that looks like. So there's different ways just in normal life that we can share our testimony, our story. We have testimony every day um, and share our story of how God's interacting in our lives. And that's a very natural way to share the gospel. There's a book called Organic Disciples by Kevin and Sherry Harney. And one of the things they talk about is even like when you go to a restaurant and you're going to pray before you eat to ask the waiter or waitress if there's anything that they would like you to pray for them because you're going to pray. And so just little easy ways to naturally talk about our faith. And I think if we're living in community with anybody, like people you work with, our neighbors, that kind of thing, it's just a very natural part of bringing our faith into our life. So, and I think another thing I would caution against is that we, I think we can tend to want to make the gospel flowery and very gentle, but the truth is, it is only by faith in Jesus Christ that you will have eternal life in heaven, and that matters. And so if we really believe that, then it better be very important to us to share the gospel to anybody we care about. Right. And so I think that's an important thing to remember too. And we don't need to soften it. We just need to present the gospel because it's who God is. So yeah, that's my thoughts on it. That's awesome. I, I appreciate that. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, obviously you guys have an entire podcast centered around, um, the Bible. Um, but besides the Bible, what book out there could you talk about for days? Like which book do you want all of your friends and family to read? Um, and you just can't stop talking about for me, my favorite book, if, if you've been around me at all, you've heard me say this. My favorite book is Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. It was one of those before and after kinds of books. If you look at my copy of it, it is dog-eared and sticky notes are in it and it is underlined and it doesn't even really close good anymore because I've had it open so many times. But it talks about how do we walk in relationship with God? How do we hear God speak? How do we share the gospel. It's all of those things in such a practical way. And so if you ever have a chance to read it, I would encourage you. They also put out a devotional. And so it's just a short read every day. And you can do that as well. My husband has, I've given it to every member of my family. So my husband likes to do that as well. But Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, hands down my favorite book. 
All right. For me, it would be Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. I have to tell you, somebody gave me that book and I started reading it and I, I respected the person who gave it to me, but I started to question their character. <laughs> so I started to read this book. It's like the first seven chapters were like, I can't do this. I literally put it on a shelf and put it away for about a year. And I was seven chapters in, like seven chapters. I was just about to turn the corner to the good stuff. So anyway, we were leaving on a vacation to Mexico and I'm looking for a book. It was kind of like last minute grab, you know, while I'm packing, ready to walk out the door. Thought, oh, I'll give it a go. And I, I grabbed that book and got past the seventh chapter. Oh my goodness. So it's all about the book of Hosea in the Bible. It's, it's a love story and it is a love story of God's pursuit of us and how... I mean, honestly, I just finished reading the Torah, so this is right on the forefront of my mind, but it's the story of Israel. It's a story of Israel saying, of course, you're my God. I love you. Not so much. I'm going to do this over here, you know, and then God calling him back and calling him back and calling him back in his relentless pursuit of his people, his relentless, relentless pursuit of us, even though there are things that are shiny that get our attention and false gods, we're, you know, it's easy to read through Israel's story and go, for the love, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> Until you realize that this is me. These people are me. Like, this is my story. And so Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers is this incredible, incredible love story of God's love for us and his pursuit of us and how the things that we have done that we think disqualify us from being lovable they just don't, he loves us because he loves us and he just keeps coming for us. So yeah, I could talk about that one forever. It's so good. Yeah. So Shauna, isn't that the book you were reading in the airport and somebody actually said to <laughs> yes. you, when you finished the book, she put it down and somebody looked at her and said, I have been sitting across from you for an hour and a half. And that's the first time I've seen your face. That has got to be some <laughs> book. <laughs> I literally like shut the book, put it on my chest. And at this point we're like loading the plane. So I'm like dragging my suitcase behind me and I like shut the book and I put it on my chest and I went, oh, <laughs> they're like, it was actually three hours. This person was like, I have sat across oh. from you for three hours and I had not seen your face. You've just been sipping on this, you know, I don't know. I think, a, uh, what's the, the lar venti? you know, chai tea latte or whatever, and just like reading that book for hours. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's so good. So good. I love it. Okay. But question, does that mean that you were crying in the middle of the airport while reading the oh, end yeah. of Redeeming Love? Okay. Oh, honey, that's not the end of the story. I got on the plane and I needed to process what was going on in my head. And so I opened up my journal. I happened to be in a middle seat. I had a man on my right and a man on my left. And I'm like, you know, blow the nose and like wipe the eyes and like write, 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 and then and open up the book and read a little, you know, revisit something and shut it. And yeah, I was processing through the whole flight. I definitely, this was definitely not happening in my 30s when I cared what people thought or my 20s when I cared what people thought. This was much <laughs> later in life when I was just like having my moments and it didn't matter that, you know, I was sharing an armrest with the stranger on either side. And having this very emotional moment. It literally reminds me of when Tyler was going to study abroad in Germany for six months. And so I got to bring him there. But when I left, I got on the plane. I was good until I said goodbye and then started to cry. I cried all through check-in. I sat in my seat waiting for my plane. I cried through all that. I got onto the plane and just tears rolling down my face, but I literally was a middle seat sitting between two men. And I'm telling you, these men did not look to their side no. for a second. No. Their eyes barreled straight forward. <laughs> I made them so uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Unashamed. You just <laughs> embrace the emotions, you know? Um, okay. I was recently having a conversation um, with one of the pastors here at Emmanuel, and the question came up. Um, about if Paul was writing a letter to the current church in America, what do we think his letter would say? And so I want to pose that question to you guys. If, if Paul was writing a letter to current American church, what would Paul say? That's a great question. Do you want to go first, Jodes, or do you want me to go? Go ahead. I... I think Paul would say, are you uncomfortable? 
Because in the American church, we're pretty comfortable. And following Jesus was never meant to be a cozy situation. Like he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to pick up your cross and follow me. Like following me means actually taking steps towards me. So if you're comfortable, if you're reclining, if your feet are up, if you're settled, then I would question whether you're actually following Jesus because following Jesus requires you to take steps. And so I think he would press us on our comfortability and he would say, you know, he would challenge us to, leave that behind and to wholeheartedly follow God. Because there are people all around the world who, when they make a decision to follow Jesus, sometimes they get cut off from their family. When I was in India back in January, uh, got to spend some time with a, a ministry and a pastor that leads a mega church in, in Mumbai. And he was sharing that, you know, they still do some arranged marriages in Mumbai. But he said, when a young woman gives her life to Jesus and she enters into the church and it means that her family completely cuts her off, then it, she becomes my daughter spiritually. And it's my role. It's my job to help find her a mate for life, help find her a husband. And I just thought, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing that, that they view spirituality that way and, and take the family of God that seriously. But also what a strange thing for us as Americans to think like, I think most of the time we think, you know, my life is fairly good, but I feel like a little bit of Jesus would be an upgrade, you know? So we just want to add a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of moralism, a little, a little bit of, you know, doing the right thing makes me feel good about who I am. And I want to add that to my very comfortable, cozy life instead of recognizing that following Jesus means he then becomes the Lord of my life. I'm not the Lord of my life and adding a little extra. I'm, I'm literally forfeiting it. I was crucified with Christ. Therefore I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me and the life I live in the body. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I think, I think Paul would challenge our comfortability. What do you think, Jones? <laughs> Well, can I ask a follow-up question yeah. really quick? Yeah. Andy, Shauna, what um, do you think it looks like to be uncomfortable as a Christian in today's world? I think it's going to look different for every single person, what it means to be uncomfortable, but it means that there's always something in front of you that God is calling you to. So there's, there's an obedience. In my life, there's an obedience that I know what God wants me to do and the question is, am I stepping into it? Am I, am I walking into that? And if you're, if you're in God's word, if you're in the word, you're going to be challenged. There's going to be, um, like obedience is a catalyst for growth. So if you don't want to grow, just don't obey. <laughs> but if you do want to grow spiritually, then you're going to be obeying the things that God is calling you to do. And so if you're regularly in God's word, if you're in a relationship with him, it's just normal to be uncomfortable, to have something in front of you that God's calling you to do that feels bigger than you. It feels like I'm not sure that I'm capable of that or um, that's going to require the Holy Spirit's intervention for me to be able to accomplish that. Like that's just normal in the Christian life. Yeah. And so if someone right now is hearing you and feeling convicted, like looking at their life and thinking, wow, I am very comfortable and I can't recall a time that I was uncomfortable for Christ, what what would you tell them? What would you say is their next step or what would you recommend? I would say, first of all, what is the one thing in your life that you know God wants you to do that you are not being about right now? And if that, if, if you don't have an answer to that question, I would say, are you in the word? Because I think if you are in the word, then you have an answer to that question. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. I think one of the things, if I can just piggyback on that as well, I think we as believers in Jesus Christ are citizens of heaven. And that means that we're foreigners here. So that means we should not look like the rest of the world. We should not seek the things of the world, we, we should actually, I mean, if I travel to another country, I'm not going to speak the same. I'm not going to have the same um, habits or I'm probably going to even dress different. 
that's how we should look in the world. We should look different. And so if I'm seeking comfort, I'm looking at how I can fit in. If I'm seeking God, then I want to represent him because that's where I belong. So I think that's, even if that can kind of help as a seeking comfort versus really living for God, um, it, we definitely do look different. Yeah. Can I go to the Paul question? Yes, please do. Yeah. So my answer would be very similar to Shauna's, um, but also similar to something I said a little bit earlier. I think one of the things Paul would say, or I would like Paul to say, is <laughs> don't, don't soften the gospel. Don't butter it up so that it's palatable and easy to accept. The gospel is the truth of God. And so we need to preach the word of God. And we need to preach it as it was intended to be preached instead of trying to make it easy for people to um, accept without having to adjust their lifestyle much. And so I think that's an important thing. And I think our church does that. But I just think that's an important thing. And then another thing I think I would love, Paul, to tell the church is when you come to worship, when you come to church, it's actually not about you. It is, you are coming to church to worship God. And so if we step into the doors that way, that means that then I'm going to prepare my heart before I walk in the doors of the church. I'm going to spend some time in worship in the morning. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be ready when I come in to give God the glory and to worship him. And that means I'm not going to complain that somebody was sitting in my pew or that... I didn't like the first song they sang or something like that. So that's a little sassy. But um, I definitely think we can come into church with the mentality of I'm here and I want them to do exactly what I want them to do and I want to feel good when I walk out. Um, The truth is I hope you walk out convicted and leaning in to what God is showing you that, that day and for that week. So that's my two cents. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, good word. Hi, this is Jody, And we just want to say thank you so much for joining us today for our 50th episode. Shauna and I had so much fun with Bailey in the studio that we could not fit it into our normal 30 minute episode. And so we're going to break this one into two episodes. So we want to invite you back next week to hear the second part of our interview process with our niece, Bailey Talsma. And this week, remember, we serve a real God and he really loves you.